Ginger Johnson with Defined Health, and I want to welcome you to another edition of our Insight Series webinars, and today we have a repeat performance from David Loam. Um, he is a consultant with Defined Health, and the title of his presentation is Novel Therapeutics for Fibrotic Disease, Has Their Time Finally Arrived? Um, first, I just want to spend um, a couple of minutes uh, talking about Defined Health and some of our conferences coming up. Um, Defined Health um, brings you webinar conferences as a way of showcasing how we think and view various critically relevant topics for the biopharmaceutical industry moving forward. Um, we're able to see important changes on the horizon by virtue of our day job, which is consultant, consulting with hundreds of pharma, specialty pharma, biotech, and investor clients, bringing to those clients our unique perspective, which has grown over 25 plus years of evaluating pipeline and inline opportunities, bridging our knowledge of drug development, business development, and commercial strategy across multiple therapeutic categories. David, okay, we'll go to the slide with the uh, conferences. I want to quickly call your attention to two of our upcoming in-person events that, oh, we'll get there in a second. Um, one is the 24th Annual Cancer Progress Conference in New York in March, date to be um, announced soon. And please refer to our website, or not our website, the website Cancer Progress by dh.com for further information. And also upcoming is Therapeutic Insight by Define Health at, at EBD's Group Bio Europe Spring Partnering Conference. And this will take place March 11th through 13th in Barcelona. And at this conference, Define Health will convene a series of panels and sessions. Um, the topics yet to be determined, but as soon as we know, we will post that on our website. So to learn more about Define Health and our capabilities, um, please go to our website, which is definehealth.com, and you can email or give us a call, and we'd be happy to tell you more about ourselves. So housekeeping, the slides that David is going to go through, um, actually, they already are on our website, right? Uh, this is a slightly modified version, but uh, yeah, okay. very There's slightly. Slightly modified version, um, so you don't have to scribble notes. You can get, a, get the... Um, slides from our website, and we will try to save a few minutes at the end, I won't promise. I think David's got a whole set of slides here, but if you do have questions and we run out of time, please send an email, um, or you can use the link in the webinar, or you can just send us an email. Um, you can get all of our email addresses on our website. And with that, I want to thank you, and please enjoy this presentation, and I'll turn it over to David. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome to Defined Health's uh, repeat of the, uh, the fibrosis webinar. Again, my name is David Lom. I'm a consultant here at Defined Health. And once more, the title of my talk is Novel Therapeutics for Fibrotic Disease, Has Their Time Finally Arrived? I just wanted to start by saying I'm very excited to be giving this webinar. Um, I consider fibrosis to be one of the most exciting uh, therapeutic areas right now. It's rapidly evolving, lots of new interesting targets, and I think we at Defined Health definitely consider this to be uh, really an area of great untapped commercial potential. What's more, I really do hope that the time has finally arrived for a novel uh, fib uh, antifibrotic agent, because as my first slide points out, it's been reported that as many as 50% of all deaths in the developed world are associated with some type of chronic fiber proliferative disease. So we probably all know someone that's been affected by one of these diseases. And what do we mean by a fiber proliferative disease? Well, we, we simply mean any disease where there is um, activation and or proliferation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts um, and resulting in fibrosis. And fibrosis is simply the accumulation of excess extracellular matrix components, primarily collagen, in organs or tissues. Now, the problem with fibrosis is that it alters the normal architecture of organs and tissues, and this disrupts their normal function. And in fact, fibrosis is one of the primary causes of the end organ failure associated with many common chronic diseases. So we can think of uh, hepatitis C, for example, or fatty liver disease, NASH, even alcohol abuse. But fibrosis can affect almost any organ or tissue, and it's associated with really a wide variety of diseases and injuries. And I think this graphic over on the right really illustrates this point well. 
So we can see that fibrosis can affect your eyes, uh, your lungs, your heart, the bone marrow, skin, kidneys, liver, really just about every organ or tissue. And in fact, there are some uh, systemic fibrotic diseases which affect multiple organs and tissues simultaneously. Um, and a good example here would be systemic sclerosis. But despite the high prevalence of fibrosis and its enormous impact on human health, there are currently no FDA-approved agents that can prevent arrest or reverse fibrosis. And until recently, there have been very few agents in the pipeline as well. So clearly, this is an area that offers uh, large patient populations. There's a high level of unmet need. Uh, this suggests a great deal of commercial potential. But his, uh, fibrosis has historically not been covered by pharma. So why is that? Well, for one thing, fibrosis spans multiple organs and tissues, and it doesn't necessarily fit neatly into any single therapeutic category. Perhaps more importantly, fibrosis often progresses very slowly, and this necessitates uh, long clinical trials. In addition, the natural history of fibrosis is often very heterogeneous, and this makes it very difficult to predict the course of disease, which necessitates large clinical trials. And as we all know, a long duration and a large N equals a very expensive clinical trial. Another important issue is that most fibrotic indications currently lack non-invasive clinical endpoints. So in many cases, we're forced to rely on liver biopsy, or excuse me, biopsy, tissue biopsy. Um, and this makes your trials more complicated and expensive still. Lastly, a fundamental challenge of the development of an antifibrotic agent is that the synthesis of extracellular matrix is not an aberrant process. This is a normal biological process. It's essential for wound repair and healing. So we're really talking about trying to sort of control the exaggerated, uh, an exaggerated normal biological process. Okay, so historically, there have been some challenges to developing an antifibrotic agent, but recent events suggest that pharma is becoming very interested in fibrosis. And I think perhaps the best example of this is the recent acquisition of Amira Pharmaceuticals by Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, that was back in July of 2011, and as the press release states, uh, this marked BMS's entrance into fibrotic disease. So BMS acquired Amira's fibrosis program, which included their lead acid, AM152, which is an orally active lysophosphatidic acid one receptor antagonist. I'll talk more about this later, which at the time they completed phase one clinical studies and was being readied for a phase 2A proof of confidence study, um, either for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, or systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And according to the terms of this deal, BMS paid $325 million in upfront cash, plus $150 million in future milestones. And remember, this is largely for a single product which had yet to demonstrate proof of concept. Now we can thank Biogen IDEC for a more recent example. So back in mid-February, Biogen acquired Stramedics. Their lead candidate is uh, STX100. Uh, it's a novel humanized monoclonal antibody that selectively inhibits the activation of TGF-beta, which is really a central mediator of fibrosis, one of the central mediators. And STX100 had exhibited a significant antifibrotic activity in preclinical models of fibrotic disease, as well as demonstrating uh, an attractive safety and tolerability profile in phase one. And at the time that Stramedics was acquired, it was just about to enter phase two trials uh, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I just want to point out the, the quote down below. This is from Michael Gilman, who is the founder and CEO of Stramedics, who's now at Biogen, um, who points out that uh, fibrosis is one of the most exciting and dynamic areas of drug development today. That's a statement I would certainly agree with, and I hope after uh, sitting through this webinar that, that she'll agree with that statement. Okay, so according to the terms of this deal, Biogen made an upfront cash payment of $75 million, additional contingent value payments up to about $500 million, and this is based on the achievement of certain milestones across multiple indications. Now we can go back just uh, a couple of years to December of 2010 for a third example when uh, Gilead Sciences acquired Aresto Biosciences. And Aresto's lead product was AB0024, 
That's a humanized monoclonal antibody targeting the human lysol oxidase-like 2 protein, which is a protein involved in cross-linking of collagen. It's really uh, very important for the stabilization of the extracellular matrix. Um, and according to the terms of this deal, Gilead paid $225 million in upfront cash primarily for AB0024, it's now GS6624, and at the time of this deal it was in phase one trials for IPF and advanced cell tumors. Now I want to point out that in each of these three examples what we see is that pharma was willing to pay really large sums of money for very early stage products which had yet to demonstrate proof of concept. And the valuations of these deals uh, were really much more reminiscent of established therapeutic categories such as oncology where you already have uh, approved products. But there's other examples as well. So uh, back in November of 2011, Pfizer acquired Excaliard. Uh, their lead product was EXC001. That's an antisense oligonucleotide against connective tissue growth factor, CTGF, another very important mediator of fibrosis. Um, and that program was in phase two for the prevention of, uh, of scars, skin scars. But the terms of this deal were not made public. And then we have uh, Sanofi and GSK having both recently established research units focused specifically on fibrosis. So GSK has the, excuse me, Sanofi has the fibrosis and wound repair unit, which is one of the five therapeutic strategy units uh, created as part of uh, Sanofi's new R&D model, and then GSK recently established a fibrosis drug performance unit. In both cases, potential indications include uh, things like pulmonary fibrosis, primary biliary cirrhosis, liver fibrosis, and wound repair. So clearly, pharma is becoming very interested in fibrosis, but we've known about fibrosis forever, it's been around forever. So what recent discoveries, innovations, or other events have stimulated pharma's recent interest in fibrosis? Well, I'm going to start by taking a look at the commercial perspective to see whether pharma has simply been forced to look outside its traditional therapeutic categories for novel indications which don't have competition from generic products. Next, I'm going to take a closer look at the epidemiology of fibrosis to see whether pharma has simply begun to appreciate the fact that fibrotic diseases collectively represent a huge patient population with really just a very high level of unmet need. Finally, I'll take, well not finally, next I'll take a look at the scientific landscape to see whether our understanding of the biology of fibrosis has improved sufficiently to justify investment in this area now. And then finally I'm going to look at the clinical environment to see whether the clinical and or regulatory environment has changed such that clinical trials of an antifibrotic agent are now feasible, or at least more feasible. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the commercial perspective. In fact, I'm just going to say that I think the answer to this is clear. Pharma certainly has been forced to look outside its traditional therapeutic categories. Uh, we can think of respiratory medicine or cardiovascular disease or diabetes, and in each case what we see are well-established standards of care and lots of generic products, so lots of competition and little opportunity. So I'm going to start by focusing on the epidemiology of fibrosis. Now, as I've mentioned, uh, fibrosis affects most organs and tissues, and it is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. We know there are uh, a number of indications uh, either associated with fibrosis or characterized by fibrosis which affect the liver. There's a number of fibrosis uh, indications uh, which affect the lung, the same for the heart. Um, as well as the kidney, the skin, and even the eyes. And the point of this slide is not to go through each and every one of these indications. It's simply to impress upon you the fact that there are a multitude of indications associated with fibrosis affecting multiple organs and tissues. There are two points I do want you to appreciate, though. The first is that fibrotic diseases include many indications with large patient populations and high levels of unmet needs. A good example here is hepatitis C, and we know that hepatitis C affects uh, about 5 million patients in the U.S. currently. About 10 to 30 percent of those patients will eventually develop hepatic cirrhosis. In addition, these patients have uh, about a 20-fold elevated risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, we all know that the treatment of hepatitis C is rapidly evolving, um, so these numbers are likely to, to plummet in the future. But there are other indications where uh, we have the opposite, where the incidence is expected to increase. 
Um, we all know that we have an, uh, an epidemic of obesity in the United States, and along with that, we have increasing rates of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, NASH, associated with fatty liver disease. It's been estimated that about 12 million people in the U.S. Uh, may suffer from NASH. Right now, there's no uh, therapy of proven benefit for NASH. It's really just about modification of risk factors. And in terms of unmet need, we know that about 15% of people with NASH will eventually develop cirrhosis, uh, so fibrosis uh, of the liver. And the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma is elevated in these patients as well. As well. So at five years, the risk may be as high as uh, 15%. Again, with the increasing rates of obesity, with increasing rates of diabetes, and along with that, diabetic nephropathy. Uh, so again, uh, renal fibrosis. So about 20 to 30 percent of all diabetics will eventually develop nephropathy. That uh, equates to about 5 million in the U.S. Uh, current treatments may actually slow disease progression, but there's still unmet need for a drug that can halt or reverse disease progression. And lastly, we have uh, heart failure. Um, also associated uh, with a lot of fibrosis. Uh, we're looking at about uh, 6 million in the U.S. Again, little in the way of treatment aside from lifestyle modifications. And again, um, a large uh, level, a high level of unmet need. Now, the second point I want you to appreciate is that fibrotic diseases also include orphan indications with a high level of unmet need. Um, a very good example here is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. Um, really no treatments uh, in the U.S. right now, nothing approved. There is profanidone in the EU and Japan, but this really has a dire level of unmet need. So the median survival is two to three years. Five-year uh, five mortality rate is between 50 and 70 percent. We also have uh, systemic sclerosis. About 70 percent of systemic sclerosis patients have pulmonary involvement, either pulmonary arterial hypertension or interstitial lung disease. Right now, no curative therapy short of lung transplantation, and about 42% of the patients with interstitial lung disease will die within 10 years. Again, high level of unmet need. Um, IGA nephropathy is another example. No FDA-approved drugs right now, a number of off-label treatments, though. And uh, in regards to unmet need, about 50% may progress eventually to end-stage renal disease. That does take a long time, however. And a final example is chronic renal allograft nephropathy. So that's fibrosis uh, that occurs uh, following a renal transplant. Um, the exact incidence is currently unknown, and that's largely because it's called many different things. But we do know that uh, about 17,000 kidney transplants were performed in 2008 in the U.S. Right now, treatment is limited to modification of the immunosuppressed regimen the patient's currently on. So you might remove them from calcineurin inhibitors which may be associated uh, with uh, more fibrosis. And uh, renal allograft failure is one of the most common causes of end-stage renal disease. So clearly, the epidemiology of fibrosis uh, would be something that would get you interested in this area. But as I mentioned earlier, there have been some, at least historically, some obstacles to developing antifibrotic agents. And, and one of these obstacles is the lack of a non-invasive clinical endpoint. This is important because it makes it very difficult to measure the response to therapy. So currently, we're forced to rely in many cases on a tissue biopsy. So biopsy is the gold standard for assessing fibrosis, but it really has several important limitations. First off, biopsy is an invasive technique. Um, about 20% of liver biopsy patients actually experience pain, and about half a percent experience a major complication, such as bleeding. Also, it's very important to note that biopsy is very prone to sampling variability because you're taking a very small sample size, a very small sample, that is. And when you're talking about fibrosis, it's the fibrosis in a given organ may not necessarily, is not necessarily homogenous throughout the organ. Uh, so that small sample that you take may not be representative of the organ as a whole. And then finally, we know that interpretation of results from biopsy are subject to inter- and intra-observer variation. So an important goal for researchers uh, studying fibrosis has been the development of non-invasive techniques. And there's a number of promising candidates. I'll talk about some of these later. Uh, fiber test and fiber scan are good examples. I just want to point out here that there are a number of companies that are actively pursuing the development of non-invasive uh, endpoints and methodologies. KineMed is developing quantitative methods for measuring changes in tissue collagen synthesis, as well as breakdown. And then you have Epistem and GSK, 
um, recently announced a collaboration to identify biomarkers of fibrosis. We also have VG Medicine, uh, which has developed a blood test for the profibrotic molecule of lectin-3, which I'll talk about in just a bit. So again, I just want to emphasize clearly the epidemiology uh, supports uh, the, the commercial rationale for going after fibrosis, but there must be more to the story than this because we've known about this for a while. So let's take a closer look at the scientific landscape to see whether it's our understanding of the biology of fibrosis that's improved. And I'm going to start by talking about uh, wound healing, because essentially fibrosis is the result of an exaggerated wound healing response to an acute or chronic injury. Um, I'll just take a few minutes and walk you through this rather complicated slide here. But we'll start uh, with one, there is an injury of some sort to epithelial and or endothelial cells. It can come from multiple different uh, sources or means. This results in platelet activation and fibrin clot formation. We then have the synthesis and release of chemokines and growth factors such as PGF-beta um, and PDGFs. And this results in the um, recruitment, migration, and activation of a whole host of immune and inflammatory cells, uh, in some cases, but not all, uh, which themselves release uh, additional chemokines, cytokines, and growth factors. Now, all of these events eventually converge in the fibroblast, so we have fibroblast activation and differentiation into myofibroblasts, which are the collagen or extracellular matrix producing cells. So we then have the synthesis of extracellular matrix, new blood vessel formation, and normally um, the next step would be wound contraction, reepithelialization, and regeneration of damaged tissue. However, if we have chronic injury, inflammation, or necrosis, this can result in persistent activation of myofibroblasts, an imbalance in the synthesis and degradation of extracellular matrix, and then we get excessive deposition of extracellular matrix or fibrosis. Now, I just want to emphasize that the myofibroblasts are the primary source of collagen in the key cellular mediators of fibrosis. The graphic over on the right simply illustrates the fact that myofibr uh, myofibroblasts are derived from at least three different sources. The first is locally residing mesenchymal cells, so we can have expansion and activation of resident tissue fibroblasts. Um, if you're talking about the liver, then we may be talking about the hepatic cellulite cells. Elsewhere, it could be smooth muscle cells. Uh, but myofibroblasts are also derived from other local sources. So we can have epithelial and or endothelial mesenchymal transition to produce myofibroblasts. And finally, we can have tissue migration and bone marrow-derived circulating fibrocytes to produce myofibroblasts. And myofibroblasts can be activated by a variety of mechanisms, including paracrine signals derived from lymphocytes and macrophages, so TGF-beta, CTGF, IL-13, and PDGF, to name just a few. Um, they can also activate themselves, so we have autochrome factors secreted by myofibroblasts, again, TGF-beta. We also have pathogen-associated molecular patterns produced by pathogens that can interact with uh, toll-like receptors or pattern recognition receptors in fibroblasts. And finally, Intrinsic changes in the activation status of epithelial cells and fibroblasts can actually promote growth factor independent fibrosis. So a good example here is the Wnt beta catenin signaling, which is constitutively active in some type 2 uh, alveolar epithelial cells in IPF patients, as well as in mice with blamycin-induced uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So clearly, this is a very complex process. There's lots of molecules and pathways um, and a lot of redundancy. But interventions aimed at multiple points of attack could potentially be antifibrotic. And those antifibrotic interventions typically fall into one of four categories. The first is simply to eliminate the cause of injury or their mediators. So if you control the underlying etiology, um, this might be expected to be the most effective antifibrotic treatment. And we can think of uh, antiviral therapy for hepatitis C here. If we control the virus, if we eliminate the virus, then we can prevent uh, fibrosis and perhaps even allow uh, repair um, of, the liver, uh, of, of the fibrosis that's there. Another approach is to reduce inflammation in the immune response. So we know that persistent inflammation may precede or accompany fibrosis. And drugs that target inflammation, corticosteroids, also immunosuppressive drugs, can have antifibrotic effects. However, we also know that fibrosis develops despite steroid treatment in many patients. Moreover, 
some fibrotic diseases appear to be driven primarily by inflammation independent mechanisms. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a good example here. The third approach would be to reduce fibrogenesis by inhibiting the synthesis of uh, matrix components. So we know some of the central mediators of fibrosis, molecules like TGF-beta-1, CTGF, if we were to target these molecules or pathways, um, this would presumably affect the synthesis of matrix and uh, suppress uh, fibrosis. And many of the programs and molecules we'll cover in the subsequent slides fall into this category. Finally, we could attempt to reverse fibrosis, uh, potentially by increasing matrix degradation, uh, by activating endogenous matrix degrading enzymes, for example, such as the matrix metalloproteases, or stimulating apoptosis of cellate cells. But I think this approach is by far uh, the least well-developed of the four that I've, I've talked about. Okay, so what I want to do with the next slides is I want to talk about, I want to introduce you to some of the central mediators of fibrosis. Um, and at the same time, I want to describe some of the more interesting programs currently in development which are targeting these, uh, these more central mediators. I'm going to begin with TGF-beta. So this is a pleiotropic cytokine that affects cell proliferation, differentiation, and apoptosis. As we all know, it's involved in a multitude of homeostatic functions. The TGF-beta is also known to be a master regulator of fibrosis. So it stimulates fibroblast proliferation. It stimulates the conversion of fibroblasts to myofibroblasts, which we now know produce collagen. And it inhibits the expression of extracellular matrix genes. It really has a, a central role in fibrosis. And of the many examples implicating TGF-beta, in fibrosis, one of these is that TGF-beta gain-of-function mice develop progressive fibrosis resembling systemic sclerosis. So, <clears throat> Genzyme originally developed uh, frezolimumab, which is a human monoclonal antibody that inactivates all forms of TGF-beta. There are multiple forms. Um, that's now with Sanofi, of course. Um, in phase one trials, prezolimumab was found to be safe and well tolerated in patients with primary focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, that's a, a form of renal fibrosis, as well as IPF and renal cancer. And uh, prezolimumab appears to have entered phase two trials for fibrosis, although it's not clear as to which indication, and it's also not clear whether uh, Sanofi will ultimately uh, continue developing this, this program. Now, another important mediator of fibrosis is connective tissue growth factor, or CTGF, which is generally thought of as a downstream mediator of TGF-beta. It stimulates matrix production by fibroblasts. Um, it also stimulates fiber myofibroblast differentiation. CTGF is induced by a number of profibrotic molecules, such as TGF-beta, angiotensin II, um, oxidative stress, Importantly, CTGF is overexpressed in patients with diabetic nephropathy, chronic allograft nephropathy, scleroderma, as well as lung fibrosis and hepatic fibrosis. Now, Fibrogen is developing FG3019, which is a fully human monoclonal antibody targeting CTGF. Um, they have shown that FG3019 inhibits fibrosis in animal models of diabetes, kidney fibrosis, as well as radiation-induced pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, FG3019 is currently in phase two trials uh, for patients with liver fibrosis uh, due to chronic hep B infection that's in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, trials, phase two trials in IPF are currently underway as well. I just wanted to point out at the bottom here that there were two trials uh, in diabetic nephropathy and then in glomerular nephritis, uh, which were terminated. And it's unclear at this point as to why those trials were terminated. But Fibrogen recently announced uh, some promising preliminary data from their phase two study, which is an open label study of FG3019 in patients with IPF. This comes from just at the beginning of this month. I won't go through all the details here, just want to point out the highlights. Um, so a substantial portion of the patients who entered the trial uh, with FEC percent predicted values above the median, so greater than 63%, are experiencing stable disease or improvement in pulmonary function. Um, in addition, uh, there appears to be an improvement in lung fibrosis as measured by HRCT, uh, two different methods there. And based on these preliminary results, Fibrogen uh, did announce that it plans to expand this ongoing open-label phase two study. 
Now, another in intervention targeting CTGF is EXC001, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this is an antisense oligonucleotide. Um, it's currently uh, an intradermal injection of EXC001. It's currently in phase two development for the reduction of skin scarring in the U.S. As I mentioned earlier, um, this was originally developed by Excaliard, which was acquired by Pfizer in uh, November of 2011. Again, uh, the details of that, uh, that deal were not disclosed. <clears throat> okay, so developers have been working on TGF beta and CTGF for years, for quite a while. However, little progress has been made against these targets. Clearly, TGF beta and CTGF are key mediators of fibrosis. But both molecules are also involved in numerous biological processes aside from fibrosis. Therefore, safety and tolerability are likely going to be key concerns, at least when considering the systemic blockade of either molecule. Having said that, in phase one trials, frezolimumab was found to be safe and well tolerated in patients with various fibrotic indications as well as renal cancers. And likewise, FG39 appears to have been safe and well tolerated in phase one trials as well. And then I just noted that, so they have some preliminary data from phase two. But there is still reason to believe that systemically targeting these central mediators may not be without negative consequences. Um, an example is that treatment with an anti-TGF beta antibody in a mouse model of myocardial infarction uh, resulted in increased mortality. And again, this does suggest that systemic blockade of TGF beta might not be a viable antifibrotic strategy. In addition, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, uh, there are the two trials of FG3019, which have been discontinued, and we really don't know why that was. Okay, so uh, targeting these uh, more central mediators of fibrosis may have uh, some issues in regards to um, off-target or non-antifibrotic effects, but there's certainly um, a, a large number of very interesting, um, more targeted approaches in development. And a really interesting target is lysophosphatidic acid, LPA. This is a bioactive phospholipid, which has been implicated in a whole host of biological processes, including proliferation, survival, motility, and differentiation. Interestingly, fibrosis is associated with increased production of LPA, as well as some of its receptors in a number of organs. Um, and moreover, deletion of the LPA receptor, or inhibition of the receptor, has been shown to inhibit fibrosis in animal models of kidney, lung, vascular, and dermal fibrosis. So AM152 uh, is developed by Amira Pharmaceuticals. Uh, that is an oral small molecule LPA1 receptor antagonist. And preclinical data showed that AM152 reduces the fibrotic activity of fibroblasts in vitro, and it reduces fibrosis in numerous animal models. So the bleomycin induced pulmonary fibrosis model the unilateral uh, ureter uh, obstruction induced renal fibrosis model as well as systemic sclerosis and scleroderma. In addition, it was uh, safe and well tolerated at therapeutic doses in the phase one trial. And it's presumably based on this data that Amira Pharmaceuticals was acquired by BMS in July of 2011, again, for $325 million in upfront cash plus $150 million in future milestones. And I think that the valuation of this deal reflects the fact that uh, Amir Pharmaceuticals was able to show that uh, AM152 had activity in multiple animal models of fibrosis, suggesting that it may have utility in a number of different human diseases. Okay, another interesting program is STX100. That's a humanized monoclonal antibody targeting integrin alpha 5 beta 6. I won't go through all the details here. I simply want to point out that this was a very elegant means of inhibiting TGF beta activation, which sort of sidesteps the problems with systemic inactivation. So activation of TGF beta is tightly regulated in the lung by the integrin alpha 5 beta 6, which is normally expressed at low levels in healthy lung tissue, but it's highly induced by lung injury or fibrosis, and when induced, it can activate TGF beta. So inhibition of alpha 5 beta 6 may actually allow localized injury-specific inhibition of TGF beta activation. As I mentioned, STF-100 uh, is a monoclonal antibody. It was originally developed by Biogen. Outlicensed to Spermetics, who is developing it for IPF and tubular atrophy and kidney transplant. Um, and then just in February of this year, Spermetics was acquired by Biogen for an upfront of $75 million and additional uh, contingent payments up to about $500 million. <clears throat> 
Now, another interesting target is the lipyl oxidase like 2, which I mentioned earlier. This is a molecule which promotes cross-linking of fibrillar collagen, which is a major component of the extracellular matrix. So it's important for stabilizing the matrix. LOXL2 is overexpressed in lung tissue patients with IPF. And in the bleomycin mouse model of pulmonary fibrosis, treatment with an antibody targeting LOXL2, uh, reduced lung fibrosis, decreased TGF-beta, and reduced the number of activated fibroblasts. So AB0024 was originally developed by Arresto Biosciences. Um, it's currently with Gilead. Um, it's in phase two clinical trials for myelofibrosis as well as other cancers. Um, and Gilead has initiated a phase one trial of this molecule in patients with IPF. They're also planning a phase one two-way pilot trial um, of GS6624 in patients with uh, fibrosis of the liver. And again, in December of 2010, Gilead paid $225 million in upfront to acquire uh, Arresto Biosciences. Okay, another interesting program is PRM151. It's a recombinant form of contractin 2. That's a naturally uh, circulating human protein which can inhibit fibrosis. It blocks the differentiation of monocytes into fibrocytes. And Prometeor is developing this molecule for the treatment of fibrotic diseases and tissue remodeling in the eye, lung, and kidney actually have a, sub, uh, a subconjunctival formulation in phase two for prevention of scarring following trabeculectomy in patients with glaucoma. And they have an IV formulation uh, in phase one trials for IPF as well. They recently presented uh, preclinical data demonstrating that contraxin two suppresses fibrosis, neovascularization, and vascular leakage um, in the retina in animal models of retinal disease. So it's a pretty interesting program there. Now, two companies that we've recently become familiar with and another approach we've become familiar with, um, it's Galactin Biotech and Galactin Therapeutics, which are both developing Galactin antagonists for the treatment of fibrosis. I think this is another really interesting uh, approach. Galactins are galactoside-binding lectins. They're a group of proteins which have been shown to be involved in a number of diseases. Um, one of them is fibrosis, so Galactin-3 appears to play a key role in fibrosis. It promotes myofibroblast activation and differentiation, thereby promoting collagen synthesis. It also promotes activation of macrophages, which in turn can activate myofibroblasts. And importantly, galactin-3 knockout mice develop less severe fibrosis in animal models of liver, renal, and pulmonary fibrosis. And galactin therapeutics is developing carbohydrate polymers, which inhibit galactins 1 and 3 for both fibrosis and cancer. Their lead in fibrosis is GRMD02, which is a preclinical development for NASH and post-transplant fibrosis. And then we have Galecto Biotech, which was just launched in January of this year. Uh, their lead compound is TD139. That's a galactin-3 inhibitor. It's blocked fibrosis in an animal model of IPF. And they expect to start uh, clinical trials in about 15 months. Okay, so some of these more recently discovered molecules and pathways may certainly provide very promising targets for an antifibrotic agent. However, as I pointed out, products targeting these newly discovered pathways remain highly risky as they've yet to be tested in proof of concept clinical trials. The preclinical data really does look very promising, I have to admit that, and even more so when it comes from multiple models, which is what we would hope for all of these programs. Uh, but preclinical models of fibrosis on the whole are actually not very predictive of results in humans. A good example here is the bleomycin mouse model of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, that's a model that's been used to produce much of the preclinical data supporting role for LPA and IPF. But the bleomycin model is primary, uh, primarily an inflammatory model of pulmonary fibrosis, while human IPF appears to be driven primarily by inflammation-independent pathways. The last point I want to make is that wound healing is really a fundamental biological process. Um, it's very highly conserved, involves multiple redundant pathways. So we have to consider the fact that targeting a single molecule or pathway may actually not be sufficient to prevent or arrest fibrosis. Well, fortunately, there are a number of more broadly acting agents that are currently in development. Um, receptor tyrosine kinases, for example, but also um, anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive agents. Many of these are in development for other indications that so could potentially be repurposed as antifibrotic drugs. A good example here is BIBF1120 or intetinib. 
That's for Boringer Ingelheim. It's an orally available uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits a number of kinases. It's currently in phase three trials for non-small cell lung cancer as well as ovarian cancer and IPF. So there's two phase three trials for IPF, which were just initiated in May of 2011. Both are using force level capacity as the primary endpoint. And I wanted to point out at the bottom here that in the phase two tomorrow trial, uh, that's in uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, Intednit decreased the annual rate of decline in FDC by 68% compared to placebo. So that's a, that's a pretty good effect. And uh, it also reduced the incidence of acute exacerbations. It produced a small increase in quality of life as well. And it appears to have been pretty well tolerated. So this is, this is a program to watch. Okay, we also have Kanzazertip, that's junk CC930 from Stelgene. This is an orally administered junk inhibitor. Um, as we know, junks are members of the MAP kinase family, involved in regulation of proliferation, cell death, inflammation. They're activated in response to stress stimuli, uh, but they're also activated by profibrotic mediators, including PDGF, TGF, uh, beta. And a modestly selective junk inhibitor has shown efficacy in animal models of renal fibrosis, hepatic fibrosis, and asthma. Um, again, this is a, an orally administered junk inhibitor, and it's currently in phase two for IPF and lupus in the U.S. I mentioned that there are some um, anti-inflammatory agents, so we have SAR-156597 from Sanofi and QAX576 from Novartis. These are monoclonal antibodies targeting IL-4 and IL-13. Um, IL-4 and 13 um, appear to promote the development of a profibrotic subpopulation of macrophages that secrete profibrotic meteors. Uh, mediators. Um, the SAR156597 from Sanofi is a bispecific IL-4-L13 monoclonal antibody. It's being developed for IPF, currently in phase one. And uh, the Novartis compound is an anti-IL-13 antibody. Um, and Novartis is currently conducting phase two trials in patients with rapidly progressing IPF, eosinophilic esophagitis, esophagitis, and chelates as well. Um, we also have Carlimab. I'll just uh, go through this quickly, but this is a monoclonal antibody um, against CC chemokine ligand 2, and chemokines have been implicated in fibrosis. Um, blocking or deleting CCL2 has been shown to provide protection from bleomycin-induced uh, pulmonary fibrosis, at least. And uh, this program is in phase 2 uh, for patients with IPS. So inhibitors of receptor tyrosine kinases, MAP kinases, cytokines, chemokines, all of these might be repurposed as antifibrotic agents. The broadly acting inhibitors of tyrosine kinases may have a better chance of blocking fibrosis than interventions aimed at individual molecules or pathways, but safety and tolerability are likely to be an issue here or could potentially be an issue. Um, moreover, at least one receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Gleevec or Imatinib, did not affect survival or lung function in a trial in IPF patients. Interventions targeting cytokines or chemokines may have a role in some fibrotic indications. However, targeting a single molecule or pathway may not be sufficient to prevent or arrest fibrosis. And a good example here are the interventions targeting IL-4 and IL-13, which largely failed in asthma, and that's likely because of redundancy in the pathways responsible for inflammation. Um, in these patients. And, and like in asthma, right now there are no biomarkers available which would allow clinicians to select individual patients who might benefit most from a given targeted intervention, although that is changing. I mentioned earlier on uh, uh, tests like the BG Biomedicine test for, uh, for galactin-3, which is associated with uh, heart failure. Um, just quickly, I'll note that there are two programs focused on microRNA therapeutics from Regulus uh, Therapeutics in collaboration with Sanofi. Um, in addition, there is uh, Murigen Therapeutics in collaboration with the University of Texas, which is focused on fibrosis related to heart disease. And one of Murigen's lead miRNAs, uh, MIR-29, has been shown to regulate multiple components of the fibrotic response. So I just want to point out there are plenty of interesting antifibrotic targets, both old and new. But again, developers have been working on TGF beta and CTGF for years, and relatively little progress has been made against these targets. Some of the more recently discovered molecules and pathways may offer more promising targets, but products targeting these newly discovered pathways, again, they remain highly risky as they've yet to be tested in proof of concept trials. 
your repurposed anti-inflammatory agents and cancer drugs may be useful in some fibrotic disease. Again, not all fibrotic indications are driven by uh, inflammation, however, and at least one receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor has already failed to show a benefit in IPF. And once more, wound healing is a fundamental biological process that involves multiple redundant pathways. Therefore, targeting a single molecular pathway may not be sufficient to prevent or arrest fibrosis. And this has really uh, led to a growing belief amongst experts studying fibrosis that multi-agent combination therapy may ultimately be required to successfully treat fibrosis. So this does beg the question, will fibrosis be more like rheumatoid arthritis or cancer? And what I mean by this is, is fibrosis going to be like RA where we have one target, uh, TNF-alpha, and lots of companies going after it? Or is it going to be more like cancer where we have multiple, um, multiple targets, multiple pathways, and we're uh, utilizing combinations of drugs? And I think the answer to this remains to be determined. Okay, so the lastly, I'm going to touch on the clinical perspective to see whether the clinical or regulatory environment has changed. And I think the answer to that is definitely yes. So profenadone has really changed things. This was one of the first antifibrotic agents to be approved for any fibrotic disease. It's an orally active small molecule, inhibits the synthesis of TGF beta and TNF alpha, um, other mediators of fibrosis and inflammation as well. Um, although I don't think anybody's uh, really sure exactly how it works, but regardless of how it works, profenadone has shown antifibrotic activity in animal models of lung heart, kidney, and liver fibrosis. It was originally launched in December of 2008 by Shionogi as Perespa, uh, that's in Japan. It was approved in February of 2011 in the EU, and we marketed there as Aspirier. But despite an expert panel voting in favor of its approval, the FDA sent Intramune a complete response letter in 2010, indicating it wants an additional phase three trial. So let's take a closer look at the profanidone data. Well, Profenadone achieved its primary endpoint of change in predicted FEC in only one of two pivotal trials. Uh, the pivotal trial program is the capacity program, so it was two almost identical uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trials assessing the effects of profenadone on change in force vital capacity over a 72-week period. One study that 004 is shown below was positive, and it did match the level of benefit observed in two previous Japanese trials. Um, but the other study, 006, did not meet the primary endpoint, although there were positive trends observed in FDC and a number of secondary endpoints. And I just want to point out here that there has been some speculation that the FDA's re uh, reluctance to approve profenadone may also, have, uh, may also have had to do with uh, the endpoint employed, FDC. Um, it, it's been speculated that the FDA may want to see a survival benefit but we can take some guidance from the fact that uh, Intermune has had discussions with the FDA, and they have actually initiated that uh, requested additional uh, phase three trial, the ASCEND trial, again using change in FDC as the primary endpoint. So despite having so far failed to gain approval in the U.S., profenadone really has helped to establish a regulatory path for antifibrotic agents, the treatments of IPF. I'll just add to that it's not just profenadone, but all of the other agents tested in IPF that have failed along the way that have really helped to uh, demonstrate, to define the best clinical path. Okay, and it's, it's very interesting to note that despite having shown only modest effects in IPF, analysts forecast sales of profenadone would reach uh, over a billion by 2020. Initially, it looked like there was going to be some snags here. Um, Intermune was launched, uh, they launched profenadone in Germany in September of 2011. And the Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare initially concluded there was no additional benefit provided by profenadone. Uh, but just recently, Germany's Federal Joint Committee uh, granted that additional benefit. In addition, in April, France's Transparency Commission issued a favorable, a favorable opinion for reimbursement as well. So it looks like um, the payers are starting to get in line and uh, agree to pay for this product. Okay, um, so clearly idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is quickly becoming a crowded space in which to play. Um, this slide uh, simply indicates all of the different companies that are getting involved, both large and small. So undoubtedly the EMA's recent approval of profenadone has helped to stimulate uh, interest in IPF as well as fibrosis. 
But I want to switch gears now and talk about what are the other factors which have convinced pharma to settle on IPF as the preferred indication for which to develop an antifibrotic agent. Well, first, IPF is a chronic progressive lung disease. It's fatal. There's currently no treatments approved in the U.S. Um, IPF is characterized by fibrosis of the supporting framework of the lungs. Um, right now, there are no uh, treatments aside from profanidone in the EU and Japan. Um, so treatment is really just palliative. So really, uh, unmet need is extremely high for patients with IPF, median survival two to three years, five-year mortality rate is 50 to 70 percent, and just as an aside, first responders to the World Trade Centers in 9-11 uh, have been found to be an increased risk of developing IPF and other interstitial lung diseases, again, increasing the desire for new treatment. Also, unlike other types of fibrosis, IPF can be diagnosed non-invasively with high-resolution CT. Um, this has been a really important change over the last five to ten years. Um, IPF is now more clearly classified and easily recognizable by, cl by clinicians. Uh, it's really just the gold standard for diagnosing IPF right now. And the two figures over on the right, uh, the top shows a magnification of a lung biopsy um, from a patient showing usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, which is sort of a hallmark feature of interstitial lung diseases, including IPF. And down below, we have the non-invasive HRCT, which also shows the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern um, in a patient with IPF. So the use of, of HRCT to accurately diagnose IPF was an extremely important advance. In addition, uh, the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society have established uh, guidelines recently, which really have enabled standardization of clinical trials. <clears throat> Another important point is that progression of IPS can also, of IPF can also be assessed non-invasively by measuring changes in force vital capacity, which is a standard a spirometric measure of pulmonary function, changes in serial measures of lung volume. It's a widely accepted reflection of disease progression in patients with IPF. It's commonly used primary endpoint. <clears throat> And I just want to point out that FBC is, in fact, a reliable, valid, and responsive measure of clinical status in patients with IPF. I did bring up the fact that it's currently unclear whether the FDA will approve an IPF drug without a mortality benefit, but we can take guidance from the fact that, again, Intermune is proceeding with its phase three trial, again, using FBC as the primary endpoint. Again, this is just a reminder that IPF is quickly becoming a crowded space in which to play. And this is important because given the limited number of IPF patients available, recruiting for clinical trials is likely to be very competitive in the future. In addition, if profanidone is approved, uh, novel agents may subsequently be compared to profanidone instead of placebo in clinical trials. So it may be time to start thinking of um, indications uh, other than IPF. In the short term, I think what we need to be thinking about is what other indications might provide a similar path to approval as IPF for an antifibrotic agent. So we want to be thinking about um, indications that have orphan drug status, a um, high level of unmet need, no FDA-approved agents, and perhaps most importantly in the short term, a non-invasive clinical endpoint. And uh, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list. It's, it's just a few examples of uh, indications that meet this criteria. Systemic sclerosis is a good one. Um, it has, uh, it's an orphan disease, <clears throat> high level of unmet need, and we do, in fact, have non-invasive clinical endpoints. If we're talking about uh, the lung uh, uh, involvement, we have force vital capacity for the skin. We have the Rodman skin score. We also have IJ nephropathy. Again, uh, no FDA-approved drugs, and about 50% of patients may progress end-stage renal disease over a long period of time. Uh, possi uh, possible non-invasive endpoint is proteinuria, although uh, the case would need to be argued with the FDA for that. An interesting example is prophylaxis of radiation-induced fibrosis. We know that when we treat patients with uh, radiation, for example, for lung cancer, uh, they can get fibrosis <clears throat> in their lung, uh, in their skin. Um, and we do have non-invasive endpoints here. Again, we can use force vital capacity or the Rodman skin score. And a final example is chronic renal allograft nephropathy. I mentioned this earlier, but this is fibrosis that occurs following a renal transplant. Again, it's an orphan indication. 
Um, there's uh, limited treatment options available, and there would be non-invasive clinical endpoints, potentially uh, glomerular filtration rates for proof of relevance or proof of concept, a graft survival perhaps for regulatory approval, and there is the added benefit to these patients. Uh, many of them are also undergoing a protocol biopsy. So biopsies, uh, they'd be more amenable to biopsy. Okay, so additional fibrotic indications may exist that, like IPF, offer orphan status, high level of unmet need, no FDA-approved treatment for non-invasive clinical endpoints. In the long term, I think what we need to be thinking about is what advances are required to facilitate trials in indications with much larger patient population. Um, I've talked about quite a few of these, but a good example here is NASH, so liver fibrosis associated with NASH. Right now, we have to rely on liver biopsy, but there's certainly a number of other methods in development. Uh, right now, many of the simple biomarkers have low accuracy, um, and some of the more advanced markers have an unacceptable cost-benefit ratio. But recent data does indicate that the results of combination serum tests, such as fiber tests and ELF, may actually be more accurate than biopsy in predicting risk of decomposition and overall survival. Unfortunately, uh, the clinical acceptance of serum biomarkers is still quite low in the U.S. We do have other methods of non-invasively assessing fibrosis, so transient elastography, a fiber scan. This is a method of measuring liver stiffness, which correlates uh, with fibrosis. It's the most widely used non-invasive technique in Europe. Um, advantages here include it's rapid, non-invasive, reproducible, requires information from a, a much larger portion of the tissue than biopsy. It does have some disadvantages in that um, it, it's not particularly sensitive. It's best at measuring fibrosis, um, either the lack of fibrosis or a lot of fibrosis, and its utility is limited to patients with narrow intercostal spaces or morbid uh, obesity. Of course, that may be a problem when we're talking about patients who have NASH who are likely to be uh, overweight. We also have uh, ultrasound uh, and MRI, and I won't go through the details here. Um, so I think the take-home message here is that although non-invasive techniques to measure fibrosis are an, act, an area of active research, at least for the next five years or so, tissue biopsy is going to remain the gold standard. Okay, that brings me to my conclusions. I just want to emphasize the fact that large numbers of patients, a very high level of unmet need, interesting targets, and a lack of competition make fibrotic diseases very appealing. So collectively, fibrotic diseases represent a huge patient population with a very high level of unmet need. Moreover, there are numerous fibrotic diseases which qualify as orphan indications, and this raises the prospect of lower clinical development costs and premium pricing. There certainly are plenty of interesting antifibrotic targets, both old and new. However, targeting a single molecular pathway may not be sufficient to prevent or arrest fibrosis. And again, this begs the question, is fibrosis going to be like RA or oncology? So will we be targeting uh, one or a few central mediators or targeting multiple pathways and having combination therapy? Certainly the EMA approval of prevenidone has helped to establish a regulatory path for antifibrotic agents and IPF. And Pharma appears to have settled on IPF as the best indication to develop an antifibrotic agent. But as a consequence, IPF is quickly becoming a crowded space in which to play, and this is important because given the limited number of IPF patients available, recruiting for clinical trials is likely going to be very competitive. In addition, if profanidone is approved by the FDA, you may subsequently have to compare your novel agents to profanidone instead of placebo. So we might soon need to be considering fibrotic indications other than IPF. In the short term, I think we need to be considering indications that, like IPF, offer orphan status, high unmet need, no FDA-approved treatments, and have non-invasive clinical endpoints. And as I pointed out, there certainly may be um, indications that meet that criteria. In the long term, we want to be thinking about those much larger populations. But until non-invasive techniques to measure fibrosis are developed and validated, the clinical trials are going to requiring biopsy will remain difficult and expensive. Now, my last slide is simply uh, to point out some things you might want to consider if you do have an IPF or fibrosis program, or if you have agents which might be repurposed as antifibrotic agents. If you have an existing fibrosis program, you're going to want to consider what's the best indication which to demonstrate proof of concept, 
next, what's the best indication in which to gain regulatory approval, and are those indications, in fact, one and the same? If you've already picked your indication, you want to consider what's the best compound or intervention. And again, you do want to consider is fibrosis going to be like RA or oncology. If you have an existing IPF program, you're going to want to consider is IPF the best indication for proof of concept? Um, more specifically, if proof of concept comes for your product later than for other IPF products, does it really still make sense to continue development for IPF, perhaps in combination? Or can your proof of concept generated for IPF be extended to other fibrotic indications? And given that some of the underlying pathways are shared, this may be, uh, you may be able to extend that proof of concept to other indications. Finally, you want to consider what other fibrotic indications should be considered for products that are currently seeking proof of concept in IPF. And if you have agents that might be repurposed as an antifibrotic agent, then it's simple. You want to consider what indication is the best fit for my product. And I'll just take a minute here to point out that that indication prioritization projects, opportunity assessments, and uh, search projects where we go out and search sort of the you know, universe of available projects are all uh, core competencies of defined health. So if any of you have uh, projects, uh, you're either involved in fibrosis or you're interested in getting uh, moving into the space, um, we certainly can help you out with any of that sort of project. And I'd just like to thank you for your time today and uh, wish you the best of luck with all of your fibrosis projects. That's it. Thank you, David. Um, I think we've used our full hour. Um, but again, if you have questions, please, um, the webinar will be up for a few more minutes. You can use the webinar or you can send us an email or if you just want to talk further with David, um, please give us a call or send an email. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Thank you, David.